All right, somehow OBS has broken everything. That's okay. All right, welcome to Evidence-Based Audio Engineering number 179, and this is I Am Being Impeded. And mostly I'm being impeded because um, we just don't have the kind of sources we used to have for learning and, you know, places you could actually go to learn about stuff, test things, uh, get, like, actual science-based <laughs> subject matter. Wow, this room is ringing like crazy right now. I don't know why. Uh, hold on, sorry. There's, there can't be an electronic problem. Let me just make sure there's no headphones going. Yeah, this room is ringing and ringing hard right now, and I don't know why. I foam the crap out of it. Anyways, um, wow. Yeah, sorry. I'm really ringing. Why am I ringing? Okay, let's, uh, let's hope I'm done ringing. So, yeah, that's, that's a big problem nowadays is where do you turn for information? We've done plenty of shows talking about how, what Google brings you to maybe, you know, mostly commercials or, or just crappy advertisements or, uh, clickbait sites. And nowadays you guys know that when you go to look for information, you get these sites where it gives you first, they give you a couple paragraphs on why you're even talking about the thing. It's like some school project, Upwork or whatever. It's just, it's just, in, it's just clickbait. And, um. It's hard. Even the bike stuff. You know, if, if I didn't have such a deep ties with the BMX community, I wouldn't know what the hell to buy anymore for bikes and things. And for the dirt jumpers that I'm doing now, you know, I, I'm not finding any good source of information. And it's the same thing. I'm going through kind of going through camera hell right now. I'm trying to get better camera stuff going, you know, rather than just these little webcams and things. I got to, you know, I've been doing, trying to do a lot of top down uh, technical work on, um, you know, soldering and whatever. And um, having a lot of trouble, you know, we still got that 29 li minute limit. Okay. Listen, Europeans, um, actually it's probably not even your fault. It's your camera manufacturers. I don't care what the European union camera video guys are doing that there's some kind of tax on a video camera or whatever. This is America. When you sell it here, just we'll pay the tax. I don't care. Just take away that stupid 29 minute limit. Get out of there. Um, I know some of these cameras aren't doing that now, but really, I, I don't know. I don't know what the hell I'm doing. I'm trying to use these cam link HDMI inputs and, and the stuff. Like if you saw last week's show, just complete epic fail. So I've been going through camera hell this week. I'm just using this webcam. It's working. I did a nice video the other day with the, with the camera going straight from the top. I'm probably going to end up using my spare old phone for one of them. And who knows? Um, but anyway it's hard to find information on these cameras, you know? So it's, it's really, we live in an age when we have tons of information, it's just impossible to get through now. And, you know, we, we talk about signal to noise ratio and, you know, my company, we make noise gates, right? Because we're trying to discriminate between the sound we want and the sound we don't want. And, uh, somebody has got to cut through the search engine noise because right now it's just worthless. It's, you, know, you just end up with spam. So anyways, so first thing here, um, I want to look at um, Safe Space had a uh, best studio gear. They want to see if there's anything on here that we even care about, right? Um, the best, 10 best Thunderbolt and USB audio interfaces in 2022. Guaranteed they're going to put Universal Audio on there and uh, probably not for a good. Yep, Universal Audio Apollo. How, how would I know it was going to be on there? That's just, uh, that's just amazing, huh? Um, Apogee. Well, yeah. You know, I mean, <laughs> some of these companies have a very long history of actually making stuff that works well. Uh, UA and Apogee aren't them. Uh, yeah, I've seen, I don't know how many abandoned wares I've seen by Apogee. Uh, here's RME Babyface Pro. Well, good. So you got a good idea there. Audient just came out with that Evo line. I wonder what that's like. It looks like a really good deal. Focusrite Claret Plus 4P. Are they even making this now? A lot of these companies had to cut lines because of the chip shortage. Um, yeah, I'm, this just looks like an advertisement. I don't know what I'm looking at. That's 10 best microphones under 300 for recording vocals in 2022. I am interested in this. Why are they the 10 best? We asked the gearspace.com hive mind. So is this come from a poll? Um, 2020. Hey, look at that. Number one, Mike. Audio Technica 2020. Okay. So maybe I have to take a better look at this stuff because man, this works awesome. 
Uh, you saw Vern Grainer, who was on this show, the amazing things he does with this mic. Um, Ormadio 47 Jr., isn't that what I have? Um, I got two of these, I think. I haven't really used them much yet. I want to. I, I bought the black ones from Guitar Center. I don't know what I'm looking at. Uh, SC Electronics, SC. Oh, are they still around? Uh, these Lewitts, man. They look like 414s. Everybody's loving them. I'd like to try one, actually. I know Tommy got some, too. Antelope. No, I'm not buying anything from Antelope. You're going to sing into that? Let me try. RE320. T1, man. But that's funny that the 2020's up there. All right. right, let's. Uh, I'm not going to torture you guys too long with this. 10 pieces of gear to improve your podcasting and streaming audio quality. All right. I see a Samson USB mic on there. Um, really? You're going to use this mic for podcasting? Okay. SM7, of course, they're going to say that. Chris, I got an RE20 right here, so I can't say nothing. Um, Arms baby face, bro. I really, I don't know, man. Uh, Zoom H4N. I don't know how. Are you really streaming with that? I don't think so. Roadcaster Pro. That looks handy. I, I don't think I really want one of these, but I should actually look into this. Let's, let's look at what this thing actually does. Okay. So, you know, for somebody like me who uses OBS and, and I have a lot of troubles of getting in and out of, um, you know, the problem everybody has, moving audio between apps and the, and the computer, um, getting out to your streaming software, like, what would I do? I'd come out my, my RME into that thing and then out that thing back into some, I'm not sure. So let's, let's look at what this is. Because I think this is just a mixer. I don't think it's got any internal stuff to move things around. Let's see. All right, well, that's absolute garbage of a description. Let's, let's take a look. Roadcaster Pro. Oh, wait, there's a Pro 2, so seems this is old. Four mic preamps, eight faders, eight programmable pads, USB to host, Bluetooth, Mac PC. I don't think this is going to do anything for somebody like me who's already using OBS. Um, that looks cool. 700 bucks. I don't know. I, I buy the baby face. Uh, some headphones, some little speakers, reflection filter. Not not bad. That would, if that was that ring, that, that would probably help. Alright, well. Um, is there anything else interesting on this list? Virtual instruments, top selling synths, best keyboard synth. See, I always wonder who this page really is for. <laughs> you, this is kind of telling it, huh? Ten most popular compressor plugins. I don't care. Ten of the best audio repair software plugins. You know, this has come a long way lately. Uh, then there's some cheaper ones out right now. Akisonus Era Bundle. I'm not sure what that is. This Acon Digital stuff. I was tripping out that man. These these guys had made some like free plugins that were pretty cool, but they made a. I tested one of these fixers. Antares uh, stuff is too sketchy. Cedar Audio is still around. Uh, Isotope, of course. Um, RX9. RX, wasn't it RX7 before? I guess it's, it's two more better now. Uh, Soothe. Uh, Waves Restoration Bundle. Interesting. Okay. So what else do we got here? I think that was it on this list. Ten most popular DAWs. You guys even care? I don't think so. Yeah, this looks like aim. All right. Um. So here is the new product alert. Let's see if we see anything fun in here. Um. Still talking about the crazy headphone thing from Stephen Slate, five hundred dollar one, whatever. Uh, Mixbus 32C version 8.1, nice, native to M1 uh, Apple stuff, Air Windows making a new amp sim, nice, uh, that's kind of cool, audio thing fog convolver, I think that was around for a while, um, 
active subwoofer. What does that mean? This isn't like, didn't they have like active uh, uh, bass traps for a while? JMP. Oh, see, I saw this. So this is looked interesting. So somebody made the, um, even though wasn't it Scuff Ham Amps that actually was the developer of the actual JMP one, they got plugins, but these guys made the actual JMP one looking thing. Um, of course, they, they changed a little bit. I, I, I really wanted JMP one so bad back in the day. It was like a Marshall. It was one of the earliest MIDI preamps, and it was it was Marshall's one. It was it was pretty cool, um, but yeah, I couldn't afford anything like that. I actually no, you know what? I saved up my money. I was gonna buy either this or an MP2. I ended up buying an MP2, and I loved that. But I had to trade it for some wheels. Um, <laughs> I had a kind of crazy life then. That, but that's cool that there's a JMP one. We'll see if it how good it is. Let's give it a test next time. Um. This guy named his software product Vegas Audio. That's, I don't know, dude. That's kind of lame. Wow. I, I literally wouldn't have called it that, but maybe they don't know. I mean, you know, it, like, okay. So if you weren't around for too long, Vegas was one of the earliest DAWs. It was actually my favorite back in the day and uh, kind of what Base Reaper on. Um, complete SSL subscription. Neural DSP releases yet another one of these partial plugins. All right, I'm sounding too negative. Let's let's go on here. So one of the things I want to talk about is, is speakers. I um I went actually ordered one of the Celestion FRFR speakers. It was the F12 X200. It's like a 200 watt full range it's got a tweeter in it and oh man that was a funny argument at a forum the guy insisted there was no tweeter there's a tweeter in it okay um and you know you, you could put it in your regular guitar amp and uh or a, a purpose-built cabinet and if you look at their cabinet that they meant for you to have um 12x200 cabinet um Celestian specked out something. And, you know, believe it or not, as much as I know about audio, I don't know much about speakers. Really. And so Celestian had this one. And it had a port in it and a closed back. And recently, I think we talked about it on this on this show, Jim Lil did a video uh, showing what actually made a difference to, to the cabinet sound. I don't think he did ports, though. And... Um, I never really understood what these ports were for. I heard people tell me that they make uh, an extra octave of, of bass or whatever. So, um, and if you look at Celestian's one, yeah, take a look. They, they've got a, they actually got a PDF that you can build. There's actually a guy on, on uh, eBay that builds these and sells them. And he, he look, they look really nice. So, tell you exactly how to build this, uh, this speaker cabinet here. And so, I, I might end up porting one of the guitar cabinets or something. I just stuck it in a guitar cabinet. And it's uh it's sounding amazing. I, I'll just absolutely love it. But um let's uh let's see. Show you. I'm just let me check on I got a I got a band in right now, I'm making sure everything's cool. Um it is okay. Sorry. Uh, so so these these guys are showing the port and like the length of the port seems to matter. The diameter of the port seems to matter. Um, they said, port baffle hole diameter to be determined from OD of pipe. So, I think they're just saying, you know, it has to be, you, you got to have the inside diameter a certain size, and, you know, then you're going to have to figure out how much to cut out of the wood, whatever. Uh, so, it, it sounds like this is critical, and... Um, so I don't understand. So I was looking in Wikipedia. I know not the best place. Right? Um, but they, when I did the ported thing, it, it, it went to base reflex. And so I'll read you what Wikipedia says. So a base reflex system, also known as a ported vented box or reflex port, is a type of loudspeaker enclosure that uses a port or vent cut into the cabinet and a section of tubing or pipe affixed to the port. 
This port enables the sound from the rear side of the diaphragm to increase the efficiency of the system at low frequencies as compared to a typical sealed or closed box loudspeaker or an infinite baffle mounting. Uh, okay, so wait a second. So this means that it's the back of the... Uh, well, you can't see my fingers. What am I doing? It's the back of the enclosure. The speaker comes out the back. And then that... Or actually, sorry. The... The rearward, so if, if, if normally it's kicking this way, okay, that's your forward. And then when it comes back, it's pushing the air that's in that cabinet, I guess, the cabinet volume, and shoving it out that little port. And that is going to add some bass. Is that how it's working? So is the port meant to be the right length to, to create a phase? Reese, because that seems like you're putting out of phase bass in. Or maybe not. Okay, so let's see. A reflex port is a distinctive feature of this popular enclosure type. The design approaches approach enhances the reproduction of the lowest frequencies generated by the woofer or subwoofer. The port generally consists of one or more tubes or pipe mounts in the front baffle or the rear face of the enclosure, depending on the... Ex oh, okay, so if it was coming out the rear, you would... You wouldn't be worried the same way about the phase. Okay. Depending on the exact relationship between driver parameters... The enclosure volume and filling, if any, and the tube cross-section and length, the efficiency can be substantially improved over the performance of a similarly sized sealed box enclosure. And, um, you know, I'm wondering if I'm going to get a lot of more bass out of my uh, FRFR if I put in a ported enclosure, but I kind of don't want it. I'm pretty happy with the way it sounds. I stuck it in a Fender Mustang, and I, I got to tell you, except for the fact that the Mustang volume knob is um, garbage, uh, Although, somebody sent me a schematic, and I was able to get a little bit better idea. And so I ordered some pots. And, uh, so I, we, we might fix it this week, so we'll see. Um, okay. Uh, comparison with passive radiator. So I think this, yeah, saying, it's saying this is making a Hemholtz resonator, basically, out of your speaker. Uh, but in, instead of stealing bass, this is going to add it. Um, the frequency at which the box port system resonates, known as the Hemholtz resonance, depends upon the effective length and cross-sectional area of the duct, the internal volume of the enclosure, and the speed of sound and air. In the early years of ported speakers, speaker designers had to do extensive experimentation to determine the ideal diameter of the port and the length of the port tube or pipe. However, more recently, there are numerous tables and computer programs that can calculate for a given size of the cabinet how large the port should be and how long the tube should be. Even with these programs, some experiments, well, okay. Um, I don't understand, but you're just going for one frequency? That that sounds wrong. It seems like this is like an EQ that's going to completely wreck your your setup. Hold on. Um, if this vent air mass box air springiness resonance is so chosen as to lie lower in frequency than the natural resonance frequency of the bass driver an interesting phenomenon happens the back wave of the bass driver sound emission is inverted in polarity for the frequency range between the two resonances since the back wave is already in the opposite polarity of the front wave this inversion brings the two emissions in phase although the vent emission is lagging by one wave period and therefore they reinforce each other this has the useful purpose of producing higher output for any given driver excursion compared to a closed box, or conversely, a similar output with the smaller excursion, which means less driver distortion. The penalty incurred for this reinforcement is time smearing. Is it just time smearing or frequency smearing? In essence, the vent resonant augments main driver output by imposing a resonant tail on it. For frequencies above the natural resonance of the driver, the reflex alignment has no influences, for frequencies below the vent resonance, polarity inversion is not accomplished and the back wave cancellation occurs. Furthermore, the driver behaves as though suspended in free air as the box air springiness is absent at that frequency, right? I don't know that this is explaining it this well. Um, let's see. So there's some greater... Okay, limitations. I don't know about limitations. What about disadvantages? Um, seems like you're you're throwing a whack out EQ on this thing. Yeah, sorry the the background. Hey, hey don't 
DMCA me and Nancy Pelosi. I'm sorry, this band practicing, they're playing some some covers. So I think uh I don't think anybody's gonna die, nobody's getting this stuff stolen. Alright. Um Yeah, so that's Wikipedia's version of ported whatever. Um so related to this, I want to talk about and look at speaker impedance. So Probably, if you're a guitar player, much to your chagrin, you've come across an impedance mismatch where either a speaker was too low impedance or low ohms, you know, 4 ohms, 8 ohms, 16 ohms, or whatever. Um, it was unsafe for your amp because it's too low impedance, or it's not making enough power because it's too high impedance, or whatever. So, I always wonder, why do you make different impedances of speakers anyways? Like... Why wouldn't you just make them all eight ohms or whatever? And so, um, there's a couple different different pages here. I'm gonna look at this uh, Jeff the Gray Geek. Um, he says speaker impedance refers to the load of a speaker, the load of a speaker places on the amplifier. Uh oh, well, that is the effect of speaker impedance. Technically, speaker impedance is the resistance of a speaker offers to the current supplied by an amplifier boy this is not sounding good um the impedance isn't isn't a fixed thing this is the, the thing about speakers like i don't know much about this stuff but this is the part that i understand very well um let me see if there's a picture of this okay here we go if you look so this is a, a picture of a um probably an eight ohm speaker Right. Let me see what they're going to call this. Um, yeah, this one says it's an eight ohm speaker. Okay, so there's a there's a point in this where it's eight ohms. <laughs> the lowest it ever has is eight ohms, or that's actually a little bit less at some super low frequency. They're calling this an eight ohm speaker. Okay. See you guys with all your your purity, super flat whatever. Um, that's what you're looking at. Uh, I don't even know what, you know, they, they don't really put very good um, demarcations on this, but I suppose that there, you see there's a spike uh, low, low down, like 100 whatever hertz, especially if this is a guitar speaker, you know. Um, if you look at this, flip it over, and that's the curve you're, if you ever look at a speaker simulator, like an impulse or whatever, Look at the curve that it puts out, and it's going to look very similar to this curve upside down, except for this part will probably be flat at, uh, at, across the top because we're not boosting back in under 100 hertz or whatever normally. Some, sometimes you would. So this is Jensen. I don't know which Jensen this is. This is Jensen that makes guitar speakers. It could be. Builder profiles. Let's see. Okay, well, I think it's his Jensen that makes the speakers, but not Jensen that makes the Transformers. There's a lot of Jensens out there. Okay, so they say, the speaker ohm rating is an indication of the speaker's AC impedance, which varies with the frequency of the input signal. This variation of the speaker's impedance can be seen on the speaker's spec sheet impedance curve. This is why the spec sheet indicates this speaker to have an 8 ohm nominal impedance. And you look at this thing, almost all of it is above 8 ohms, you know? Um... Okay, let's see what they say here. Most of the speakers are available in alternative ohm ratings, usually 4, 8, and 16 ohm versions. This variety allows for more flexibility in matching the overall equivalent impedance of your speakers to the output impedance of the amplifier. It is important that the output impedance of your amplifier matches the overall equivalent input impedance of your speakers for maximum power transfer so that you do not, and so that you do not damage the amplifier. Um, so you can wire them in series or... Um, parallel, whatever. Um, but it's not really a very good um, definition of impedance. Let's, let's, look at, let's look at speaker impedance. Let's see somebody with a good one. I'm not sure what... I think Splice is that uh, plug-in company. Look, this is the problem. Where do we go for somebody you trust? Um... Why not of these? See, this is scary. Uh, no, I don't want videos. Hold on. 
See, you know, back in the day, Google was useful. Nowadays, it's completely useless, man. Um, let's see. Oh, I'm not sure if she is. Learning about electronics, maybe. Yeah, I, I, I trust this a little bit more than um, than the speaker sites. Honestly, that's that's kind of sad to say, but it's true. Okay, uh, learning about electronics says all speakers come with a rated impedance. I, well, that's a, it's already untrue. Um, speaker impedance is the amount of resistance that a speaker offers to the electrical current that flows through it. Um, so I had a couple questions. You know why? Why do we use different impedances? Why don't why aren't they just all four ohms or all eight ohms or whatever? It'd sure be a lot easier to make the amps than that. Um, and so if you you know if you use a speaker with a lower impedance than the amplifier drive, you might overheat the amplifier, and you, really you can short circuit an amplifier. You think about look at this impedance curve again. So imagine your um, your power amp. Your two wires sorry let me turn the camera back on your two power amp wires and they're here except for an eight ohm resistor that's not much resistance eight ohms is jack diddly right and um you know so you better have a hefty one that can dissipate a lot of watts and now you're talking like two ohm resistor or something you may as well stick them together like that's not much resistance and it might even go below two ohms. You know, like, look at this eight ohm one. It seems to go down to uh, a little bit below eight ohms anyway. So that's how you cook these things. Okay. And then if you um, if you put uh, too high of impedance on, you know, you're you're it's a voltage divider, right? Um, so you're not getting as much out of the amp as you as you could, and and you know if you uh, had like a four by twelve, you probably wired them in series, parallel or series or parallel. So here's some. Um, put them in series. You know you put the put the positive to the positive of one speaker, the negative of that speaker to the positive of the next speaker, and you um, add the two resistances together directly, and that's your impedance. Or that's you know. You remember your electronic theory and stuff. Um, if you put them in parallel, you're basically going to divide them in half. Um, if you, by, or you're going to divide them by the number of speakers. So if you have, you know, your your two 25 watt speakers, um, yeah, this isn't how I do it actually. You you would end up with with only four ohms, right? Or you use two 16 ohm speakers, you end up with eight ohms. Uh, and series parallel is how you usually see these uh, 4x12. So if you do it in series parallel and they're all the same impedance, you end up with, at least in a 4x12, you end up with the same impedance as any one speaker. Right? So, but but why? Why have different impedances? And so, let's see if Jensen has anything to say. Um, they're showing about the, the wiring, but what is the sound? Um, they don't seem to say much about or anything about why you would have different impedances for sound. Um, let's see if somebody else has something to say about it. Uh, most hi-fi amps is okay so let's let's try this google again um why have hold on let me answer this real quick sorry hello
All right, sorry about that. Uh, some problem with the live stuff. Um, I see one that says the truth about speaker and penis. I'm not sure who these guys are. Uh, they make speaker wire and cables, which scares me. Uh, unless, you know, because this is one, it's one of those ones where we, we always talk about, like, the crazy fake speaker wires, like $60,000 wires and premium oxygen-free straight wire music premium cable. Yeah, see, I'm not going to take any advice from these guys right here. Sorry. Here's Sweetwater, which is going to be hit or miss. And Sweetwater, I love you. Um, I was bummed that you sent my stuff FedEx because that cost a really penny. And they missed their window like they always do. Um, anyways. Okay, so somebody... So they're asking the same question as I do. Why do speakers have different impedances? Um, is there an audio reason for this? Um... What they're saying, if all other things are equal, the only difference in speakers with different impedances is by definition the impedance. Not to be too glib about it, but in practice, that pretty well sums it up as well. There are numerous factors that go into speaker design that we really don't get into here to understand how things work in practice. Suffice to say that in modern designs, you may encounter a variety of impedances among loudspeakers that are otherwise nearly identical from an operational point of view. Further, once multiple speakers are combined in an enclosure with a crossover network, a new net impedance for the system will result. This is the load the amplifier sees, but it may not be the actual impedance of the raw components. Okay, that doesn't really help. Um, speakers with higher impedances will result in less current flow from the amplifier. While it is sometimes true that this can result in slightly less distortion in the amplifier, and why is that? Is this like one of those little feedback loops where you can, um, the higher impedance... Can be uh, keep things from ringing, uh, keep oscillations under control. Why? Why would that be? Um, but that's that's interesting. Um, it isn't always a major consideration. There are other issues such as damping factor that are also affected by the load. But those are all considerations that often take a back seat. But is the damping factor depend on impedance? Uh, what you gain by having lower net impedance is more power output from the amplifier. Again, why don't we just have two ohm speakers, all of them? Uh, you might find not find this to be a huge concern in the studio, but in sound reinforcement applications, it is quite often the foremost concern. When outfitting a large PA system, you can cut the number of amplifiers you need nearly in half by working with the 4 ohm loads instead of 8 ohm loads. And when you're talking about dozens of amps, that can be a big cost savings. Okay, so we know about the power thing, the maximum here. In fact, let's just let's just put this in here. Maximum power transfer theorem. Maximum power transfer theorem explains that to generate maximal external power through, an, through a finite internal resistance (DC) network, the resistance of the given load must equal the resistance must be equal to the resistance of the available source. In other words, the equip the resistance of the load must be the same as Thevenin's equivalent resistance, or the resistance of the load must be equivalent to the resistance of the circuit, right? Um, and that's where we'd be. You got an eight ohm amp, eight ohm amp. You got an eight ohm speaker, and you get the most out of it that way. But is that true? Because if you got four ohms, you're going to get even more, right? I mean, uh, <sighs> this is confusing stuff. Okay. Um, I know for a guitar player, like we're talking about right now with these FRFRs, I just ordered a um, Harley Benton, one of those little 100-watt pedal amps, and I just found out that it's 220 volts instead of 120 volts, so I had to buy a voltage adapter regulator to run the Euro power stuff on this, but um, hopefully there's a tap in there that I can just change it so I don't have to use that silly thing. But um, this thing will do 190 watts allegedly at four ohms and 100 watts at eight ohms um i'd rather have the 190 watts you know so uh it, it seems like the same amp will give you more power at, at, at a lower ohm mode um, so i don't know about that uh, how does maximum power transfer equate when you're talking about speakers and amps um because no it's not true you would you're going to get more power out uh anyway um so you know, as as guitar players, you're always looking for for more power out of your amps, right? You don't want to. You can carry half as many amps. That'd be nice. Um, or at a more practical level, for most musicians, look at the following example: You have a bass amp, and you need a good speaker for it. You can choose an 8 ohm 15 inch loudspeaker or a 4 ohm 15 inch loudspeaker. Your amp will produce, say, 250 watts into 8 ohms and 500 watts into 4 ohms. 
you may or may not decide to get the 4 ohm speaker to maximize the output of your amp. Or maybe you could get two 8 ohm 15 inch speakers and wire them in parallel with another one to produce a 4 ohm load. Aside from those practical considerations, another reason it's more common to see speakers with lower impedance these days is because modern amplifiers are more capable of remaining stable while delivering large amounts of power into these loads. And there you go. Maybe it's not frequency, maybe it's not any of that stuff. Let's look at um, impedance versus stability. Let's see, is this oscillation they're talking about? Um, See, these are talking about some big system. How about speakers? Uh, uh, must include stability. Come on. AV gadgets. What is AV gadgets? I'm not sure what this is. They are an Amazon associate. That doesn't mean that they're bad. I tried to be one once. Um, let's find out. You know, I, I specifically said stability. I swear there's a stable. Yeah, where is this? Do I have to find the cached version of this? I swear it said the word stability on here. Where is it? That impedance switch on your receiver is a lie? No. So where was it? Oh, maybe it's in a comment. Um, no. That was helpful. Um, okay, so that's not helpful. Speaker stability versus impedance. See, we're learning at the same time here. You know how enjoyable that is. Speaker impedance versus sensitivity. Bob is the oil guy, okay? Um, so this is an automotive electrical. Hey, I'll trust the car electrical guys more than I'll trust one of these guys selling the, the $90 guitar cable, right? Um, this will very are you talking oh sensitivity not sensitivity stability stability jeez see this is what i'm talking about google is pretty much worthless now speaker stability now sound on sound used to be great this is a 2013 forum post so well let's see um The output of the amp to be zero. Uh, let's see if I can find this stability word. Okay. Um, no, that's that's not really helping. Yeah. So I, I've seen this in a couple places. I've I've seen oscillation ringing and stuff. Um, that the the more impedance you got, the easier it is to control that. And and isn't that true in microphones? Like that was one of the reasons. Like. You know, you had all these big deal about these low Z mic preamps and, and low Z mic mods. And these are mostly the mics that, like, SM57s and whatever. They're not really meant to put out pristine 20 kilohertz uh, signals, right? Um, yeah, see, these guys, I don't trust any of these. Embedded, embedded audio. Matching and tuning output, stability, stability. Yeah, I guess this is a, again, this is one of those ones where there's, um, it's just hard to find information on. And it's something that a lot of people take as just gospel that, you know, there's a, that higher impedance speakers sound better. So I always hear it. Higher impedance speakers sound better. The higher impedance, um, you know, higher damping factor, um, more stability. I just wonder if that's not true at all you know i'm not seeing any real good evidence for it i can see how it'd be easier uh but you know with with the production techniques we have now we should be able to get it pretty low and, and we're seeing all these like super low power um 
or low draw, let's say, um, like Class D amplifiers and stuff, and they're, they're teeny weeny little things. Actually, I, I, I'm probably going to get a couple of them to try with different guitar cabinets and stuff because they're tiny. They don't weigh anything, but they're crazy loud, like my, like my FR, FR speaker I got out there. And they run into really low ohm loads. Um, so the other one was headphones because all these these crazy problem you have with all these headphones and these people just scream up and down that oh yeah you can't use low impedance headphones or you can't use high impedance headphones and so here's a site called headphone like headphone honesty head honesty um the importance of matching headphones with audio sources in the pursuit of high fidelity audio and you know already when you talk about audio files you're like oh that's scary um but see what they have to say impedance matching why are some headphones higher low impedance let's check that first headphones with impedance greater than 100 ohms are typically older professional studio specific designs pre-1990s receivers and pro audio equipment often use resistors to attenuate the speaker output to create simple and inexpensive headphone circuit um, oh yeah you <laughs> you could run resistors in parallel with power apps and stack them that way and then run each tap out to headphones that was what do they call it, like the 70 volt system or something crazy like that? Um, or you could you could run a whole ton of them if they were super high impedance and not make much draw at all. Um, yeah, in fact, I was looking at that yesterday because we we're um, actually testing the output of uh, the uh, Fender Mustang 3V2 to see just how flat it was for powering that, that um, Celestion FRFR. And um, some of my direct boxes have amp taps on them, but they're they're meant to be run in parallel, and they have super duper crazy high impedance. So you're not really gonna run power through them. Um, okay. Without okay, so here's a, again. This is very barely touching the surface. Without getting too heavily into the math behind it, the high impedance load preserves the source audio output. Or sorry. Without getting too heavily into the math behind it, the high impedance load preserves the source output voltage to be able to drive multiple pairs of headphones. Um, so yeah, there you go. If you have a super high impedance, you know, you could put a bunch of them on and the app's not really going to see much difference. Um, this idea was so prevalent that even as recently as 1996, the standard recommended source output resistance was 120 ohms and went so far as to claim that source impedance had very little effect on performance. Um, stereo file said something. I don't know if I trust them. Uh, I think Ethan said that was actually a good magazine back in the day. Um, most modern headphones are designed to appeal to as wide a market as possible, and that means that they must play well on mobile devices. The sale of hundreds of millions of battery-powered music players, including the ubiquitous iPod and more recently smartphones, have made the lower impedance around 32 ohms headphones the norm. Um, why? You're not saying why. Um, yeah, see, I, I watch on these, uh, like the Helix forums, or at least the gear page when they're talking about Helix, which headphones do I use? And they all talk about the same headphones, but they're, which, which version, which impedance do I use? A 32, 250, or 600, or, you know, whatever, 32, 80, or 250. And, um, let's see what it does here. So square wave response. Do I care? Um, okay. So you're showing the biodynamic DT880 uh, between the 32 ohm, 250 ohm, and 600 ohm. And it says, um, the above graphs show the square wave and impulse response of the three DT880 impedance headphones. Here you can see that the 32 ohm dt880 rings markedly more than the other two headphones so again um less stability so it's like oscillation or whatever so what is it is this one hit of a square wave and this is the this is the, the post ring um yeah let's see cnet says and i didn't like this though because cnet often uses weasel words uh, the impedance of a headphone is largely determined by the driver's voice coil and for biodynamics, high impedance models, the voice coils wire is super thin, just 0 0.018 millimeters, half the thickness of a human hair. Biodynamics senior project, I explained. Um, 
The thinner wires have more windings uh, on the voice coil than the lower impedance biodynamic headphones, which have thicker and heavier, easier to manufacture voice coils. The lower moving mass of the 250 and 600 ohm headphones voice coils is lighter than the 32 ohm models, and the lower mass is part of the reason high impedance headphones sound better. Okay, so he's saying high impedance headphones sound better, um, but they're talking about different things. Okay, the voice coils have lower moving mass on the on the heavier, thicker and heavier ones. That makes little sense to me. I would think that if, if you're going to make what are you making some lighter drivers? Um, smaller diameter of the 600 ohm voice coil wires allows the wires to fit tighter. Okay, this is speaking backwards. Okay, hold on. Let's read this again. Um, thinner wires have more windings than the lower impedance headphones. Okay, okay. So yeah, the the, the the higher impedance ones have have much thinner windings. Okay. Um, the smaller diameter of the 600 ohm voice coil wires allows the wires to fit tighter, so there's less air between the windings, and that makes the electromagnetic field of the voice coil stronger. All of that reduces distortion for the high impedance versions compared with the low impedance headphones. Okay, so why don't we run high impedance headphones for everything? Uh, if properly matched to the appropriate amplifier, it is possible to achieve an enhanced quality of sound with high impedance headphones, at least with specific designs like the biodynamic models shown above. Please don't take this to mean that excellent sounding low impedance headphones do not exist. This is just one company's approach. Okay. Um, so they're talking about sensitivity. How sensitivity and impedance impact volume. Uh, sensitivity and impedance are related but not causally linked. Both must be considered when pairing headphones with sources. Um, uh, it is tempting to describe impedance as simply being resistance to use Ohm's law to, to calculate voltage equals current times resistance. But Ohm's law is really only applicable to direct current. If impedance was the same as resistance, comparing identical headphones that differ only in impedance was a result in the higher impedance headphone always being quieter than the lower impedance one, given the same source voltage. However, it isn't always that simple. Um, I kind of thought it was. Let's see. It's easy to understand that sensitivity and volume are directly related. All else being equal, more sensitive headphones will be louder. Um... This isn't really telling us much. It's enough to know that source impedance, headphone sensitivity, and headphone impedance are all factors that play into the resulting audio volume and performance. Okay. Um, but we're showing that some drastically different uh, impedances and in, in sensitivities. Okay. Frequency and impedance. Here we go. So, you know, just like you saw in that speaker chart, um, you know, there's going to be one peak of this stuff. Uh, driver impedance is not linear with frequency for dynamic headphones. I see there's a peak, you know, there's, it's more, it's got more impedance in certain places. And, you know, you, you got to think that in a guitar speaker, for damn sure, that means that, that at those certain places, you're not getting much of that frequency. And at other ones, you're getting too much, right? And um, it looks like that in in this guy too I'm, I'm just looking at the impedance curves forget the phase curve um so do you make your amplifier take that curve out or you're just you're sitting with the the eq of that headphone just like you're sitting with the eq of uh of a speaker so that's that's kind of sketchy um anyway so i was looking at uh Reddit, uh, which, you know, it's probably bad to do, but uh, there's a Reddit headphone thread. And um, it says in the old days, it was to allow multiple headphones to be plugged into an amp in the recording studio without having the headphone impedances drop to zero almost instantly. So you had like the super high impedance headphones back then, um, like we we're talking uh, earlier. Um, it also says, I know there are reasons that high impedance coils make it easier to control the driver. And uh, like we heard in the other one, that the, those thinner wires, you can put more of them closer together, easier to control. Um, anyway, that, that's my little journey into impedance. So uh, one thing that gets discussed constantly, and, um, you know, I got taken to task for this for a long time, but uh, there still isn't a DAW bench um, 
M1 test as much as, as far as I know. There is no Apple M1. You know, everybody talks about this Apple M1 chip is just so much better than the Intel chip, and it just blows it away and all this stuff. And every test I've actually seen, that's not true. It, it's it's for most of the part, it can't it can't come close to hanging with the Intels that I've seen so far. But we've got native M1 stuff, and it seems to be running okay. Um, as far as I know, you still use Windows if you want the lowest possible latency, the most most plug-in count. And DaBench would be the people that tell me that, and I don't see anything from DaBench on the M1 yet. Uh, but they just, well, that's not true. So let me read what DaBench just said. Um, uh, coming off of radio silence, this is from DaBench. The CPU wars are back with a vengeance sparked by Apple's return to non-x86 chips. The resulting hysteria uh-oh, from some circles is, for me, reminiscent of the late 90s and early 2000s when there was the RISC versus CISC, PowerPC versus x86 battles from their respective camps. So I don't know if you remember, Apple used to use like Motorola chips or whatever, and then um, they came over to the superior Intel chips, or maybe there's even like some run on AMDs, like Hackintoshes or something. Um, and then... Within the last few years, Apple is transitioning away from Intel in, into their own one. The M1s, which are, as far as I know, they're more like graphics chips, which is sounds pretty interesting to me. And, and it sounds like a good idea. I just, um, usually with Apple, there's so much hype and most of it's just nonsense. And, you know, we've, we've lived for decades where the Windows machines just smoke the Apples, right? So um, it's hard to believe, but I, I guess the M1s really are like that. So let's see. Um, Back then, there were more than a few questionable RDF moments with superior performance claims that were not really panning out once the rubber hit the road. Yeah. And we are again seeing the same, if not higher, level of hysteria surrounding the new Apple Silicon's performance superiority across articles, blogs, etc. You know, I heard about, like, it's supposed to be superior with the graphics. The graphics were horrible, man. Uh, I know there's some sort of thing that's supposed to be optimized for it. I'll, I'll check it out, but uh, come on. Um of course, my focus is purely audio production and DAW performance, things that are CPU bound as opposed to GPU bound, IPC, multiprocessing performance, etc. So after reading through and following up on some of the comparative performance tests posted and not getting anywhere near the variable being reported, I turned my attention to developing a suite of DAW bench sessions that would run natively on cross-platform and across both x86 and the new Apple Silicon. So finally, we're going to get some DAW bench results here. Uh, sorry, one second. Let me see what's going on. I, I don't know if I have a... Uh, so... Yeah, that should be fine. Yep. Okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, I just had my brother needed some time at the studio. Um, the next hurdle was to find trusted testers that had access to new Apple Silicon units. You should have called me. I got an M1. I have one of those MacBook Mini. It's a joke. It's 13 inches. Doesn't have any ports or anything. Total joke. Um, um, sans an emotional attachment that we oh, okay yeah he knows how much I hate apples <laughs> that we could add to the team to expand the testing pool testing is ongoing and we already have a large collated database currently we have taken a bit of a breather while enjoying some of the northern summer break but we'll finish up the testing and post the results sometime in the next month or so I won't give too much away just yet, but I will say that the results are not in line with some of the hysterical claims being made by some of the other commentators. Intel's 12th generation already has Apple's measure with less cores and with new chips coming from both AMD and Intel in the next six months, including the new HEDT Xeon WS line with the higher core. The gloves are off. Stay tuned. P.S. I have my goggles, gloves, and bio suit on hand in preparation for when I release the reports. Uh, sounds like the Apples probably aren't doing as anywhere near what people are claiming. Um, uh, let's see some of the comments here. So Sam Lowe, very interested. I've been running an M1 Mac studio for a while now. I have the suspicions Rosetta is a contributor to while things aren't as blistering fast as they said it would be as Pro Tools is still not native to M1. So um, a lot of things that are, say, M1 aren't actually for the M1 chip. They're for a... a translator program would you call it that uh, called rosetta that lets you run the older intel coded stuff onto um onto the uh, m1 chips um let's 
see. Uh, so a lot of variables, obviously, until everything goes 100% as native. But my testing is not through Rosetta. It's 100% native in Reaper. Again, Reaper rules. Sorry. Uh, using internal plugins on the DSP testing and Contact 6, which is uh, Apple Silicon native for the VI testing, virtual instrument testing. Apple Silicon is fast, don't get me wrong, but nowhere near as fast as being made out by the RDF pundits. Uh, I don't know what RDF is, sorry. Uh, Apple will need more than gains being made in M2 once the larger core next-gen AX86 hit. Interesting. Um, some people just can't handle what the hard data shows. This will be fun. I'm PC guy. Welcome Apple's innovations to the market. It spawns fiercer competition. Yes. Yes. And, and that's the thing. I think I think this M1 really did scare Intel, which is good. Uh, so when do we pick at Steinberg headquarters about MMCSS? Okay. Uh, we, we didn't, we're not going to talk about that right now. Um, I wonder if Apple is still a winner when it comes to power efficiency, though. What does that mean? Um, I mean, if, if it can't run it, it's not going to be efficient, though. Um, anyways. So, so DaBench is coming out with this thing. But there was a, uh, you know, possibly. Oh, sorry, let me get, let me check my monitors. Um, Blue Cat, who I really like. It's a really cool plug-in company. Um, we, we use, on this show, we use the, um, one of their um, frequency analyzers all the time. I was using it the other day. Um, so he did a thing, Apple M1 versus Intel for audio, a benchmark. Yeah, new Apple M1s have been available for a few months now. And um, raw CPU performance is one thing, but what's you know what does it actually do? So he, he tests some stuff. One is an Apple M1 MacBook Pro, 16 gigs of RAM. This is really similar to mine. Uh, four high performance cores and four high efficiency cores. I think that's how mine is. Is the, um, an Intel i7 MacBook Pro with 32 gigs, uh, four cores and hyper threading. Okay, and um, they're running. One's running Big Sur. One's running Catalina, 44k with an RME. Okay, so we're running good. So those have native Apple M1 drivers. And again, that provides native Apple M1 drivers. You guys that say that there's no drivers on a Mac, you're wrong. The drivers are there. They, you may not download them, or you may uh, in some cases, but they still use drivers. It's not like you get RME performance out of a Behringer when you plug it into a Mac. Um, okay. No third-party host applications nor plugin was used during this test as we have been running Patchwork or Axiom as standalone applications are loaded as plugins inside of them. They both contain a variety of built-in effects with very different algorithms. Now, are these M1 native, though? It's Patchwork M1 native. Um, but it actually, even if, it, if it's not, uh, it, it was actually doing better. So according to this, um, lowest latency without dropouts, uh, the M1 got 2.7 milliseconds round-trip latency. I think that's round-trip. Maybe that's not. Maybe that's just the... Uh, the purported latency and the Intel was at 3.2. Um, they both had some pretty low CPU use, but um, they said you, you would hear crackles. Um, and the Intel Mac, while the average CPU usage was still quite low, audio dropouts would occur at latencies lower than 3.2 milliseconds. Um, I think that's a that's a good sign. It it could be something else, but I mean that's a that's definitely a good sign that it's not longer, right? Uh, CPU performance at lowest possible latency, and um, <clears throat> average CPU and uh, when they're and they're running that lowest latency, uh, Apple was getting eighteen uh, percent in Rosetta. It was getting twenty nine percent, and the Intel one was thirty two percent. So even Rosetta is faster. That's that's kind of interesting. Um, and multi-core results are about the same. Um, and interesting, you see that it uses more on the, on the multi-core. Uh, we've kind of been telling you that, right? On, on anything, even the Intels. Um, even at a lower latency, the Apple M1 is faster than the Intel Mac, either in native mode or when running through the Rosetta Translator. So that's good. Um, but again, right now, who cares? Like, this is a big chunk of change right here, 32% compared to 18%. But with the kind of stuff people are saying, I mean, that's almost half the half the CPU use, which is great. So it's like doubly as powerful, but you kind of expect that in that many years anyway. <clears throat> 
here we come to max instances and this is where with the hype that was generating you're talking this is where it matters this is when people say okay this thing is faster you mean you can run a lot more instances of something okay max instances on m1 is four and intel is two um big deal you know but maybe this is the wrong thing to, to test with i want to see something like the rex comp test at dawbench you know if you're running 1200 in the m1 and only 600 on the uh on the intel okay we're, we're talking because that's that's a lot of different things that's got to happen right but the way these guys are talking be like four times as many or eight times as many or something um now they're gonna put uh, 128 samples latency and um, run the uh, those those CPU tests. So, um, okay, that was at the lowest latency, so that wasn't bad. Okay, so the max instances um, went from five to thirteen. That's that's substantial. Um, it's not anywhere near the hype factory, but it's a lot. Um, but again, it's kind of what you expect over time. Even if you said this was the old Intel and this is the new Intel, that's kind of what I'd be expecting to see, something like that. Uh, the average CPU, however, once we reach those latencies, you're really not seeing much difference there. 8.9 versus 13%. You, you, could, you could really move. Um, but he's saying that the M1 is much faster than the Intel Mac, I guess. Um, so at 192 samples, so a little bit higher latency. Um, yeah, see, this is narrowing the gap. Interesting. Uh, M1 stayed cool. Uh, yeah, I'm not surprised. I'm blown away by just how little power this M my M1 uses. Um, but this is this is the first real test I've seen. I don't know this is exactly how I'd want to make the test, and I'm not seeing giant things. I'm I'm kind of just seeing what I would expect to see based on the time that's passed. But at least we see something, and and I love Blue Cat audio. Let's uh. Because we're here, let's um, let's take a look around Blue Cat's site. So I like their measurement tools. Um, what's the difference between home and bluecataudio.com? Let's see. Well, that's their blog. Let's go to... So they make some really innovative stuff. Um, I don't know what this remote control thing is. But where is it? They, they make some really cool... And plugins, all software. But I want to see the um, analysis. Yeah, here you go, audio analysis. Uh, yeah, frequency analysis, and then frequency analysis multi. Those are handy. They're almost like oscilloscopes, or they're they're good RTAs. Um, frequency analysis, Freak Analyst Pro has like a 3D waterfall thing, which is really cool. Uh, oscilloscope multi. I wasn't really able to get that to do really much of um, oscilloscope functions that I, that I wanted, but it's still neat. Um, so go check them out. Uh, I got a lot of camera stuff to figure out and a lot of audio work to do this week. So I'll see you guys next week. Thanks for hanging in there, though, uh, whoever's on uh, Twitch. See you later.